Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Ramshaw. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune, and I'm a future forum board member. And thank you so much for joining us for this uh, this evening for this very important conversation on the real-world implications of Texas's immigration enforcement and anti-sanctuary cities legislation. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank you for being a future forum member. And this is a trick question. If you're not already a future forum member, it is our 15th year providing these types of uh, programming and services for the city of Austin and the state. Um, if you're not a member yet, you can sign up at our registration table or do it online. There'll be an opportunity after this evening's programming. Um, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists, starting with the Texas Tribune's phenomenal Border Bureau Chief, Julian Aguilar, who will be moderating this evening's discussion. Uh, Julian's been with the Tribune almost since its inception. Previously, he reported for both the Laredo Morning Times and the Rio Grande Guardian. Julian is joined by Lupe Valdez, the former Dallas County Sheriff, who's currently running for Texas governor as a Democrat. Valdez, who is the first Latina sheriff in Dallas County, uh, can... <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, can speak to the ramifications inside the criminal justice system of this legislation. Until last year, Jesus Garza was the CEO of the Seton Healthcare family and previously served for eight years as the city manager of the city of Austin. He also served as the CEO of Breckenridge Hospital and has been crucial to helping Seton and UT create the Dell Medical School. Stan Paz is the executive director of the Texas Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. He previously served as the school superintendent in El Paso and in Tucson and was the first Hispanic president of the Texas Association of School Administrators. And last but not least, Montserrat Garibay is the secretary treasurer for the Texas AFL-CIO, which advocates for and represents Texas workers. She is a former bilingual pre-K teacher for AISD and previously was vice president with Education Austin, the union rep that represents more than 3,000 AISD employees. Thank you to all of you for joining us. And Julian, you can take it from here. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you, uh, everybody else, for being here, especially the LBJ School. Um, like Emily said, this is probably, uh, Senate Bill 4 and immigration enforcement is probably one of the uh, most contentious, if not, um, I guess, the uh, most mysterious currently because we're still sort of waiting to see exactly what's going to happen with Senate Bill 4. Um, just to, to summarize what, where we are right now in, in the process and what's, uh, I guess, been allowed to stand and what hasn't. Uh, so Senate Bill 4 was signed by the governor in May. Um, he did it uh, during a, a Facebook Live um, was criticized heavily for that um, because usually governors they do their bill signings with you know lawmakers from from both uh, sides of the aisle sometimes or at least both chambers by their side. But I think that sort of speaks to the issue of how how sort of volatile this was. But even after he signed it, there were protests at the governor's mansion that Sunday night. Um, but the bill as signed was uh, referred to as an omnibus immigration bill because there were so many components to it. And it would have um, punished sheriffs um, and other uh, police officers, uh, constables, police chiefs uh, for not honoring ICE detainers, which are commonly referred to as the mechanisms by which Immigration and Customs Enforcement asks jails or sheriffs or constables or what have you to hold the person in their custody for uh, at least 48 hours for possible referral to immigration uh, officials for possible deportation. Uh, it would have punished, um, I think, up to $25,000 a day for officials that violated that policy that did not honor all the ICE detainers. And it's, it's been reported that it requires uh, police officers to ask status. Uh, that's not uh, what the bill does. What it does is it prevents supervisors of law enforcement officers from saying, no, you cannot inquire into a person's status. So um, currently, Texas law, uh, an officer can ask your status if you get uh, pulled over or detained, a uh, lawful detention can mean anything from uh, you know, being uh, questioned if you witness a crime or to speeding in a, in a school zone. Um, what happened subsequent to that is Judge Orlando Garcia, U.S. District Judge in San Antonio, he put a lot of these provisions on hold um, with an injunction. Specifically, the, 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 the thorniest issue was the ICE detainers that he said, you know, this, you can't comply with everything. There's other mechanisms right now. There's other litigation that it questions the constitutionality of ICE detainers. That went to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth, the Fifth Circuit let that stand, but the way they wrote their, uh, the first judge, three-judge panel of the Fifth Circuit, the way they wrote their opinion said that you, ICE detainers needed to be honored, but under current guidelines and current practices, which a lot of people thought to assume that that's what was going on anyway. Um, and now we're back at the Fifth Circuit when uh, a separate three-judge panel is going to eventually decide on the entire injunction. 
and it's the hearing was on November 7th, um, and I'm sure a lot of uh, stakeholders and law enforcement officers and journalists are refreshing the Fifth Circuit side every half an hour to see if there's an opinion coming down. Uh, the way that Fifth Circuit works, it'll probably come down in 10 minutes while we're up here having this discussion. Um, but let's hope that that does not happen. So I, I, want, I want to start with that because in, in 2011, Sanctuary Cities legislation, if you look at the bill, the word detainer was not even in the language of the bill. It was sort of styled as an Arizona copycat bill um, that pretty much allowed police officers to question anybody that they detain. That part actually is, is not enjoined. That, that, is, that is law today. And that was, I think, the big, the, the boogeyman, or the kukui, as we're more familiar with it, as um, he, here in, in Texas. So I, I guess I, I want to start off, since this is about the impact of SP4, are, are you all seeing that? I mean, uh, because there was a lot of fear about cops you know, pulling people over for, uh, the common phrase was driving while brown. And is, I want to I ask you all if you see that as happening. I mean, are, is APD going up to to Rumberg or, or Dallas PD, are they going to, to heavily Latino districts in those cities, and are they targeting brown people, or is this something that uh, people were scared of and it's not actually happening? I don't, I don't know who wants to speak to that, but if anybody has any knowledge, you know, anecdotal or statistics, I'd, I'd be really curious to see what the underground enforcement of the Papers, Please provision is. And, and of course, you, you turn right. to me, because I'm the law enforcement person, right. and of course you should, you should turn to me. Uh, well, SB4, to begin with, is, is terrible. It, it shouldn't have never happened. Uh, at least half a dozen times, more than half a dozen times, I went before the legislature to testify against this, along with the major county sheriffs and the major city chiefs. All of us had the same idea. This is not, or, or the same train of thought. Uh, this is not good for our community. Right. Um, and and I, I believe that the majority of law enforcement, there is good law enforcement and bad law enforcement, the majority of the law enforcement will follow the direction of the leader. And, and uh, it was very clear in my department, this is not what we're here for. Would people do it anyway? I don't know, I suspect they would. But it was very clear uh, what the thought of the leadership is. I mean, even the governor brags about sending me a nasty gram, pardon me, a letter, sending me a letter uh, that, that said I need to comply. Um, because my thought has always been this is not right. right. Now, you know, if, it's, if there's certain laws that, that are there, as, as a law enforcement person, I have to obey that. Mm -hmm. Now, what we can do, we certainly did. Uh, and, 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 and that was constantly, uh, bring out the thought that this is not what we're here for. Now, he turned around and said, if you even mention this, you know, we're going to fine you. Right. Because he knew that there were several of us, major, major county sheriffs, that would say to our team, you know, this is not why we're here. And that, that was, that was the part of the, uh, the provision in the bill that said, you know, that you cannot en endorse anything that materially limits or... or Sort of gives the, the idea that you're against immigration enforcement. I couldn't even say anything bad about the bill. And that's that's part of, that's part of what the the three judge panel said. Hey, you know this is too vague. Come back with us. But and and you're absolutely right. You and the police chiefs of San Antonio, El Paso, those populations, they they did testify against the bill. But be that as it may, it ended up passing. Um, so now that it's in law, are cops profiling people, pulling people over for driving while brown? You were still a sheriff after. SP4 went into effect, think, so what did you see in your department? I think the law enforcement will do what they did before. If they were, in, 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 if, if they lean toward, stop, toward asking about it, um, I made it very clear when I was there, I'm no longer there, that that's not the only reason you stop them for. Right. If they committed another crime or something, something caused attention that they needed to, to, to look at, then it, you can stop the person. But um, I think it's just like it was before. If they have a tendency to do that, then they would. If they didn't, then they're not going to. But the additional force that we put on it was, I don't want you to spend all your time waiting for ICE to come. Mm -hmm. We have other priorities. So unless you have nothing else to do, and, you know, that's... that's uh, here or there, you know, they, they could say they didn't. And, of course, if they said that, I would say, I've got plenty for you to do. <laughs> but, uh, and, but we couldn't say that. Right. We couldn't do that. So I, I think it's 
pretty much went back to what it was before. If you had a tendency to stop somebody for, the, for, for, uh, for driving while brown, because honestly, I don't think, even though he is Hispanic, that somebody looks like him was gonna be stopped as much as somebody that looked like me. M Monse, so, I mean, you, even before your current role, even in your current role now, I mean, you've, you've been active in this, you know, against this. So what, what are you hearing from uh, the immigrants that you work with, from the advocacy groups? So I think it's very clear that the message that the governor sent really scared families. Okay. Um, as a teacher and when I was with Education Austin as the vice president, I had a lot of teachers, uh, parent support specialists, counselors that would call and say, during the summer, for instance, families are not let, letting their children go to the pool or go play because they're scared. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it happened. People are scared. They don't want to come out. Uh, they don't want to drive. Uh, and they're really scared. And I think uh, at the end of the day, that's what he wanted to do and that's what he accomplished. Exactly. Unfortunately, that, that really hurts the families and hurts the community overall. When you, when you say that they're not going to the pool or going to school, are, they, are these, the, these are the children? Or the, or children, these are the and, children and the, the parents. Well, the parents make more sense because they're likely the ones that are out of status. But the children, even though they're U.S. citizens, they're, they're, their parents are keeping them home is what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, and even I think for an undocumented immigrant, for them to see, hear the news and to see what's happening, they, ha they, don't, like, they don't have an idea of, okay, what questions can they ask me? What can I answer? And I think in our community here in Austin, we were able to do a lot of Know Your Rights trainings mm -hmm. within, with the schools, with the community, to let the people know this is what they can ask you and this is what you can answer. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it comes with education, it's a, it's a, P, it's a, it's a key. If, you, if people don't know their rights, then they're gonna be scared, they're gonna run away when they see a police officer because at, that's what uh, Governor Abbott wanted at the end of the day. I think I, think I was going to follow up on Montserrat's point about the fear. And obviously every school district that we represent in our association uh, had to call a forum or some type of training because of the families and how they were in conflict. Uh, Mr. Carranza, who's the superintendent of uh, Houston ISD in Harris County, had, a, had his own uh, forum, and I congratulate you on having your forum because this is getting the word out. It's educating the public. More importantly, what he did with, with his communities, he expressed what their rights were and provided that training, that information. They put um, a web page so that they would have access, parents and, and families, about what's going on because the fear was permeating what was happening in the classroom. And for example, he told the story at one of his um, forums that a fourth grader uh, went to his neighbor and borrowed a shovel. And they asked, the neighbor said, why do you need the shovel? He says, because um, if my parents get picked up and they don't come home, we have to dig a hole in the, in the backyard so we can put money there so we have bus fare. They have backup plans for what happens to the family when the parents get picked up and then don't, they don't come back home. I mean, it, it, it permeates everything that they do and it's completely taken fear. And the last thing on their mind right now is what they're gonna to do to improve their education. Because right now, their basic survival skills and how do I make it when my parents may be picked up and not be able to come home and nobody's at home when I get home from school. So every school district, major school district, Dallas County, I've gotta commend Dallas County as well. Because when you look at Dallas County, they've done the same thing. They've passed a resolution with the school board. And in there, of course, they talk about immigration enforcement based on what the law provides. So everything is within the guidelines of what the laws are, but you've got to know your rights. And when you run away from a police officer as a young person, that's not the thing to do. Mr. Garza, what are you seeing from your perspective? Well, from, from my perspective, a couple, couple things. One is I think the fear that, that exists in, in this community isn't, isn't by and large by, as a result of law enforcement. It's about the rhetoric and the noise that's been made about uh, this specific piece of legislation and, uh, and I guess the crowing about it once it gets adopted. It created a, a whole host of fear with people. And I think then what's manifested, so it's not really law enforcement necessarily. In fact, if law enforcement has an ethic that they want to connect with the community, it, it would be the antithesis would be to, figure, to, to be a, uh, being a, bring the big hammer out with respect to the Latino community. With respect to healthcare, what you're having is uh, the individuals are accessing it a lot less. There's a lot more missed appointments uh, within our clinic systems, both People's Cl uh, Community Clinic at Buen Samaritano and uh, the, uh, the community care that's run by Travis County. All of those are having uh, missed appointments and uh, well checks, et cetera. 
And I think what's going to end up happening is those individuals that have chronic illnesses, whether it's congestive heart failure or whether it's chronic uh, obstru obstructive pulmonary disease, what, they're going to have a major episode at some point, and they'll end up in the emergency room. And it won't be just a tuning up in the emergency room. They'll probably be admitted and, and spend a great deal of resources. So I think in the end, it's going to cost our communities a lot of money. In addition, one other point I'd, I'd make is that the WIC program, uh, there was an analysis done by the city of Austin, one of the people that uh, uh, did a, one, one of the briefs that, uh, to, to uh, try to bring a, a halt to this legislation, that uh, families are, are not accessing the WIC program uh, uh, at, with the frequency that they used to. There's uh, 20,000, uh, estimated 20,000 infants that aren't getting proper nutrition. There's an estimated 43,000 children that aren't getting proper nutrition and, not, and uh, close to 9,000 pregnant moms that aren't getting the proper care and nutrition. All of those things will manifest themselves at some point in those individuals' lives. And I think that that's really the, the tragedy of, uh, of a piece of legislation like this. It's the tragedy, the kind of noise that's been made, because what it puts is a lot of fear into that community that really is... Uh, Quite unwarranted. Part part of the, uh, the the supporters of the bill said that there is uh, a provision, and they and they mentioned the fact that hospital districts were excluded from from the SB 4s purview. Which you know there are security guards and, and police officers, but they they could not uh, sort of uh, enforce SB 4. Did you have, did you all do any outreach? And is that is that a moot point because people want to believe what they want to believe? Or well, in terms of uh, the 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 health systems here. Uh, I would be very surprised if anyone asks about status. Uh, when someone presents in the emergency room, and that's primarily where individuals that are uh, not high income will, will access care, uh, once they show up, you've got to provide the care. And the last thing on your mind as a, as a, as a service provider to those uh, individuals showing up is to ask them about status. So that's not something that, uh, that, they, that they will do as a matter of course, because they, they're required by law to provide that care. Um, but. As far as, because as Senate Bill 4 passed after I left Seton, but my sense is as a faith-based organization, um, I think the position would be this. Just like the churches are sanctuaries for people of all walks of life, uh, because it is a faith-based organization and that the hospitals run by Seton are a ministry of the church, those will be sanctuaries as well. But I don't, I, I don't think that the people often know the difference. Okay. I think the fear is still there unless we provide a lot of education. Yeah. And no matter how many times you put it out, I know Dallas had all kinds of uh, information uh, uh, sessions, and yet people still did not get the message. So yes, uh, hospitals and, and, and churches are sanctuary areas, but people don't get the message. So there's still fear in going to the church, in going to the hospital. And um, the the trip back and forth, right. the the sanctuary. This it's it's not in the trip. It's once you get there, but you have to get there some way. And Dr. Paz, if I could go back to, to education and, and Monte as well. So um, there was, uh, I guess, coupled with with what's going on with DACA, um, there was a, a study, and I don't, have, I, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but there's so many, uh, I guess, thousands of teachers in in Texas that. Um, have a, a status that they could be worried about, and, and now especially with DACA and, and sort of the limbo there. Um, so can you guys speak to, not, not the students, because we've already talked about their parents, you know, being scared to take them to work, but the actual workforce in the public school system and how they're affected by SB4? Well, in the way public education operates and the way that's funded by the state legislature, it's all dependent on the student enrollment. So everything is driven by student, student enrollment, including teachers. So when you look at your teachers, 53% of the population in the public schools of Texas are Latino. And consequently, many of those Latino students, because they're first generation or undocumented, don't speak English. Right. So they're limited English speakers. Consequently, we have bilingual teachers. And they're in great demand. Every urban district is recruiting bilingual teachers. And we have so many of them that are DACA students themselves, some that are 25, some 30 years old. And they're facing this because obviously they're under siege in terms of what's going to happen to them. And we as a public school system then have to respond to our bilingual teachers and say, look, we are a safe haven for students. We're also a safe haven for teachers. You ha we cannot lose you. We can't afford to lose you. The public education achievement of Texas depends on those teachers who are qualified, who are certified, who are graduates to continue in their tenure. And here we are holding them hostage. 
So obviously, our, if you go to websites at our urban districts, you're going to hear from our bilingual teachers who are DACA students themselves. I was uh, listening to one uh, from Dallas uh, ISD, and he's talking about the support that the district provides him is how he's able to go to school and teach every day. And he has to be very open and, and upfront with the students and say, look, I'm undocumented. I'm a DACA, a, a member of DACA. And because of that, and I, I am, I'm here to tell you that we cannot be afraid anymore. We have to stand together and dream together so that we can have the success that we need. We cannot survive public education in Texas without our bilingual teachers, and many of them are being held hostage. Yeah, I mean, um, we have uh, a member, Areli Sarate, she's a teacher in AISD who has been really, I mean, her family comes from mixed status families. And one of the things that she was sharing was like, you know, my parents are undocumented. Every single day when I get up in the morning and I go to work, my mom stays home. She does not want to go outside. She, she, she's missing her doctor appointments because she just feels like she cannot, you know, I, I need to drive her. Um, her DACA expires in about a year, and even having a conversation with her students and explaining to them, I might not be here next year, but also her big concern is, what's gonna happen when my DACA expires? I'm not gonna be able to work in, in the public schools anymore, and also I'm not gonna be able to drive with a sense of, of being safe, because I might get stopped, and if I get stopped and sent back to Mexico, what's gonna happen to my mother and father uh, her, her dad is a construction worker as well, and he's really worried, right? Um, and I think with construction workers, it's, it's really an interesting thing because some of their, uh, their bosses are uh, doing wage theft. Right. So they're using SB4 as a tool of saying, well, you, we know you're undocumented, you know, I'm gonna pay you less money, and if you try to do anything, then I'm gonna call uh, the police and they're gonna take you over. So they're using this as a tool uh, to you know, keep uh, keep construction workers in fear, and they're not paying them as well. On on, on that note, thank you for, for helping me segue into the next topic. Uh, Hurricane Harvey, obviously, there's going to be a lot of rebuilding, and we've already seen stories that uh, even 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 before SB4, and I think um, DACA and other immigration policies, there was already a, a labor shortage that there was not enough you know sort of hands to to rebuild. Um, with with and now in your in your role with the with the AFL CIA, uh, CIA, what, what are you seeing as far as how SB four is is affecting Harris County, and th this is it's an interesting sort of I guess comparison to what happened post Katrina because post Katrina after uh, that hurricane hit uh, the Bush administration suspended I nine enforcement um, for for a period of a few months and their mm -hmm. statement said that they did that so people that were affected by the hurricane could um, still get work even you know if they lost their documents. Everybody kind of <laughs> sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It means like, hey, we need people to help rebuild this town. And I think um, I've heard any estimates anywhere from 12 to 15,000 uh, uh, Mexicans and Central Americans went to Louisiana to help, to help rebuild. Um, and they obviously settled there and they're still there. So with respect to what happened with SP4, what are you, anybody on the panel, what are you all hearing about the rebuilding efforts and how that's being affected? Um, with, with SB4. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the big concerns that we have right now with construction workers. Uh, there's the big need, but also, you know, if they go, outside, go out and seek jobs, they know that they're going to be worried about their status, but also they're going to have some contractors that are going to take advantage of them. So that adds another layer because they don't want to go outside and work, but they know that they have to feed their families and that they have to live every single day. But the fact is that they're living in fear. And that, it's not gonna allow us to help recover Houston uh, with all the construction that's gonna have to happen. Uh, so it, yeah, it, it's taking a big toll on construction workers, electricians, plumbers, uh, you name it. it it's definitely uh, something that it's, it, it has been impactful in, in the construction. There was an article in, uh, in the American Statesman uh, last Friday here uh, that basically doc, uh, talked about this, pro about this, about this issue. Uh, they quoted somebody who ran a business in Houston who said, if I didn't have uh, labor, uh, undocumented labor, I wouldn't have a business. And so, uh, and it's very scarce. And then their businesses were quoted in Austin saying, already we have a tight labor market mm -hmm. and it's even gotten worse. Uh, you know, when I was manager here at the city in the, in the mid-90s to early 2000s, uh, 
this city was built on immigrant labor during that it, just a, a huge boom time. We would never have been able to build the things we built in Austin without the labor that came in uh, from Mexico and Central America. And you know, you only, and the fact is, is we have a demographic problem in the United States. Uh, we've got too many uh, people my age and uh, too few of people that are, are younger and uh, able to, to do those kinds of jobs. And that's what a real issue, and the businesses were basically saying in the article, we've got to have some relief on this or we're, we're not going to be able to serve uh, the communities that our businesses serve because we don't have insufficient labor. But, uh, like once it referred to, the, there, in, in this construction, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's great for, for the, uh, the general contractor, the industry's bottom line, but there is a lot of, of wage theft, there's a lot of abuse. So some people would say, sure, it was a boom town, but it was you know, largely on the backs of immigrant labor, which were mistreated. So how would you respond to that criticism as your time as city manager? Did you see that? And if you did, what did you do to, to well, alleviate I, that problem? I, mean, I, I think as, uh, as those issues manifested themselves, or we would find out about them, we would certainly we, we would do the evaluation. This was you know, 15 years ago. Uh, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. But you have other things that have happened since that time, I think. Uh, I don't, I don't remember uh, workers' defense being around at the time when I was manager. They're here now, and I think that they're very involved in those kinds of things. I think so there are other protections that are sitting out there to try to, to, to ensure that things get done in an appropriate way. But uh, I think if, if your community is a welcoming community, and that's the ethic that's built, I think by and large things will be okay. But I think it's something you do have to watch. I, I think, think go ahead, please. I think as, as more and more diversity comes into leadership positions. Uh, we'll look for ways to stop a lot of that. I know that uh, in Dallas, there was announcements made about uh, if, if the, uh, the employer didn't pay you, then you should come talk to, to the DA. And there was a, a DA assistant that was specified for just that issue. So I think as more and more um, minorities or more and more different ethnic groups be, come into leadership, we try to stop a lot of that. But that, I mean, that's why you need uh, some uh, people in Washington need to have a smell the coffee, wake up and smell the coffee. That's why we need an immigration policy. That's why we need to have a policy in which we allow workers to come into this country to work legally uh, through green cards or other mechanisms. That way you can enforce the laws uh, to ensure that there, there's not wage theft and things of that nature. And uh, what, what we've done is by not solving that issue, we create a, a shadow labor force and it creates issues that we have to then try to resolve later. And, and law enforcement it was very confusing because you had part of the businesses, well, a lot of the businesses saying we need, and it's not only construction, it's the lawn maintenance service, it's the, right. the hospitals, mm -hmm. it's, it's the restaurants. And we could go on and on. So you have business saying to us, you know, we need these workers, where at the other time you have the folks saying you need to enforce this. Right. So it puts law enforcement into a very difficult position. Dr. Buzz, you want to I was going to mention that um, you know, sometimes we overlook that large school districts and school districts throughout Texas are not just big employers, but they also have huge bond programs, right. which means building schools, sure. adding classrooms. And those are 300, 400 million dollar bond programs, which is all based on construction. So the cost of construction mm -hmm. is continuously going mm -hmm. up because mm -hmm. of the lack of labor. And then what happens is that the school boards try to enforce yeah. some of these requirements for minority uh, participation. Uh, and then they have to follow through with more supervision because they want to make sure there's not wage discrimination mm -hmm. and that there's mechanisms so that we can track that. The problem is that the cost then is going to go up for the construction because of the supervision at the expense of people that are doing the work. So there's a disparity there, and it's an unfairness. It's an, an inequity that has to be addressed, and it's inherent, and it's not always very obvious. So there has to be some expertise and some enforcement to make sure that there's uh, ways that we can, make, that we can uh, monitor effectively the school construction program, the, the general construction in the city, and making sure that there is, if there is wage discrimination regardless of, of what the immigration status of the individual, that there's a mechanism by which they can correct it. And um, you, uh, you, you split time between Texas and, and Arizona, correct? So can, can you compare what you're seeing now with SB4 with what the people still talk about SB 1070? Because that sort of seems to fade away and people are thinking, you know, well, the people that are against SB4 hope that, that you know, it gets sort of tossed out and it, it'll kind of 
fade, but how long is that taking? What, how, how long, I guess? Are... Sheriff Arpaio's still around. Right. Um, okay. He's not gotten anywhere, and now he's running, uh, talking about running for Senate. Sure. And of course, he's been pardoned by President Trump, right. and in the meantime, the taxpayers voted him out because uh, his lawsuits alone were almost a billion dollars to defend him. Right. And, and, and here's a law enforcement agency, a leader in law enforcement, that is breaking the law and is using public funds to protect himself. But if you take him out of the picture, I'm saying, because that bill was passed by the legislature, yes. obviously, and signed yes. by the governor. So what, what are the repercussions that still exist in Arizona, and do you see the same thing happening in Texas? Well, one of the repercussions, obviously, that we see is that, that, uh, the, that the law enforcement leadership is key. So I was going to contrast that with Pima County. Okay. You have Maricopa County and you have Pima County. So you have one, which is Arpaio in, in Maricopa County, and then you have somebody in, in like Dupnik who is in Pima County who implemented the same law in the same way, totally differently. Mm -hmm. uh, because the same, I'm sorry, it's the same law, but the way they implemented it was based on leadership. So absolutely, if you have the right person that understands what the enforcement law is and they do it correctly, then you don't see the repercussions. So we didn't see the repercussions as much in Pima County as we saw them in the rest of the state. Okay. Uh, but there's still vestiges after our pile that are going on because those police officers and those sheriff's officers are still there. And they've been tainted, if you will, that they've operated in a certain way. You still hear stories all the time. I mean, I can tell you living in Tucson, but working in Texas, that I get to see both and contrast the two. So I see oftentimes what, I, what I'm experiencing in Arizona is where the current is going in Texas, and that's scary. Mm -hmm. Sheriff, I'll, I'll ask you, um, what, so again, when I referenced, uh, I think it was HB, HB 12 and then Senate Bill 9 in the 2011 legislature, the, the, the regular and the special sessions, uh, respectively, again, the language of that bill did not mention the word detainer um, at all. It had nothing to do with, with sheriff's honoring policy. What, what changed to six years later to where this was the crux of it? And I guess why... Why didn't uh, more people come out? We mentioned the business community. Why didn't more, more businesses come out uh, as a, against SB4 when the, uh, the so-called Schaefer Amendment, the Papers, Please provision, was tacked on? I was, I was on the Senate floor when, the, when they were concurring with the House Amendments, and I got an email from the Texas Association of Business saying, we're going to have a press conference tomorrow against SB4. And I, I wrote them back. I said, do you guys know what's going on right now? And an hour later, they said, okay, this is canceled. It was, way, it was a dollar short and a day late. You know? um, so... What, what changed as far as the policy, and where was business during this legislative session? I mean, did they go all in on the bathroom bill and sort of make us before the, you know, the, J, the JV, so to speak? <laughs> you know, there were so many bills that uh, we had to speak against that I, I'm not really sure what happened with business because, of course, I'm, sure. I'm not in business. But it, it was difficult for me because I would get called almost every week and asked to come and testify. And of course, we can't do that. We have to pay attention to, to our county and to, I mean, I ran, I ran the seventh largest department in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's something that happens every hour. So, but I, I think what, what it is, is that so many different issues that were going on. And, and, um, and I think it was more or less tactic. Do you run for this one or do you run for this one? Do you try to stop this one or do you try to stop this one? Which one do you, and you can't beat all of them. So I, I honestly believe it was another tactic that they did of let's put as many out there as we can, so let's see which one goes by. Did you guys want to, I mean, where, where was the business community? I don't know much people. Well, were. I think from the get-go, we need to make sure that we have elected officials that have bold leadership and say this is unacceptable, and that we don't uh, do back deals um, on, on, be, on the backs of immigrants. I mean, we keep using immigrants as a political football, and that is unacceptable. You know, we live in Texas, we have, uh, a lot of us look, are brown, and for, for SB4 to have passed, it, it just sends such a bad message for our community, for our students, and we need leaders that are gonna stand, that are gonna stand up and say enough, that this is not gonna happen. And if that means that they're not gonna, they're gonna, you know, be bold about it and not get elected because they stood up for what is right, then we need that. So was there more of those leaders in 2011 than there were this last session? or what, I mean, Probably what, so, yes. Gentlemen, do you guys want to speak to... Well, for us, lobbying? it was such a political situation for, for us to try and influence what was going on. We saw the emergence of not just our association, but others as well. Uh, uh, the Texas Urban Council, for example, was formed because they had to figure out a way to be in front of the legislature to give their position. 
And, and obviously, Dr. Cruz is here in Austin, so we can call on him, but he's only one person, and he's mm -hmm. busy trying to run a, a very large organization. So we had to back him up with some of our own members. So we've created our own uh, vision statement, and we've started to look at our priorities, and so we know what our priorities are in the legislative session. So you have to somehow say, okay, this is what we're gonna do as an organization. These are one, two, and three, four top priorities. Otherwise, we're running all over the place, putting out fires, and not dealing with some of the critical issues that we consider to be important to our agenda, instead of reacting to others. Well, I know the city of Austin took a very active role in trying to defeat Senate Bill 4. Sure. Uh, and I think that, uh, I mean, that I can't speak for the Texas Association of Business, but I, but I think it may have been just a resource issue and you don't lead with your face in a fist fight, I guess, is, is the other point, is that uh, they may have seen the writing on the wall and they said, oh, where, do we, where do we spend our political capital? Right. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that one of the, the, the things that came out of this, uh, you know, having been born in Texas uh, in 1952 and seen Texas go through a lot of things, this is a different Texas than I grew up in. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, we have never, we've been a, a friendly state, a state that's been welcoming to everyone, and this was like, you're not welcome, sign got hung out uh, at, at our border and uh, at the various borders that Texas has. And, and I think, uh, and it's terrible that we're, now we're kind of in, uh, in, the, same, uh, in the same boat with the, the, the state of Arizona and Governor Brewer where they had that, uh, the bill that was passed to here a few years ago the one that you were mentioning a few minutes ago. So I just think it's, it's really unfortunate that we've gotten to this point in terms of our political environment because this is not the Texas that has been in the past and I hope soon we can begin to change some of that. Folks, I'm gonna uh, ask one more question and open it up to questions from you all. Um, so if anybody has anything on their mind, uh, get prepared and they're gonna walk around with a microphone. But um, I guess just to, to end my part asking, so say, say y'all get your wish and the SP4 goes away through the, uh, through the judicial system. Uh, is it a moot point when we look at what's happening at the federal level? I mean, how much effort are, are y'all gonna spend fighting the state when the president is, is hell-bent. I mean, we saw what happened last week at the 7-Elevens. Um, the DHS director, I don't know if you saw the testimony yesterday, you know, and, and, and folks that you advocate for, you know, there a lot of people say they're being held hostage. You know, he, the president said he wants to protect the 750, 800,000 uh, DACA recipients, but, you know, he's hell-bent on a wall. So how much, how much of this is, is all for naught because the federal government is eventually going to do what it wants to do? I think, you know, we're living very critical times right now, and I think this is uh, the time where we need to put fire in our bellies and be so outraged by this as before, um, and really get our people to get registered to vote and to actually vote. This, this is the time where we can actually make a difference because this is so personal. Uh, this is something that affects uh, just someone that looks brown. And I think if, if we're not able to step up to the challenge and educate our communities and ensure that they're registering to vote and that they're voting, and that at the end of the day, we need to hold uh, these legis racist legislators accountable. This is the time to do it. And if we're not able to do it now, then when? Do you, so are you speaking about, I'm assuming you're speaking about the Latino vote, the Hispanic vote, which a lot of people say is the sleeping giant that's you know, been hitting the snooze button for the last you know, several election cycles. Do you think this is gonna do it? I personally think it is. Um, as I talk to even high school students and where they get to hear the stories of documented teachers and their teacher saying, means you're not gonna be here next year because your DACA is expired and they're learning what DACA is. Uh, and I think this is a really important time where, you know, back in 10 years ago, nobody knew about the dreamers. But in this time of the year, mm -hmm. people know what DACA is. People know what SB4 is. And I think we really need to leverage that to ensure that people know that we're living critical moments and that we must come out and vote. And I know for the immigrant community, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of families come from uh, mixed status families, they're doing that. And I'm personally very hopeful that this is gonna be a big change for, for Texas. Sheriff, gentlemen, do you guys wanna add how, I mean, move, moving forward, state or federal, What's, what's I think a lot of it has to do with the leadership. Even though, uh, the same thing that happened with us before. Um, uh, most of the major cities uh, just, uh, you know, every, every police officer knew what their leadership wanted. So they would, they would more or less do what the leadership wanted unless they were a rogue officer, then they would say, I have the right to do this. I think that the same would happen in the state. Um, 
we must become the welcoming, the compassionate state. We must become the state that welcomes um, people of, of different ethnic groups. By the way, when I was in uh, the Sheriff of Dallas, there was 239 different languages spoken in North Texas. This is not only about Hispanics, although we seem to take the brunt of it most of the time. There's a lot of other nationalities that are in the same boat. I think it's easier for some of them to hide because they're not as obvious as we are. But this concerned a lot of folks, and I think, it, as, as she mentioned, if we could get a lot of them um, uh, interested in voting, it hurts my heart when I hear people say, eh, why should I vote? And you're able to vote. Mm -hmm. it, that really hurts my heart. I, I, we need to have an emphasis on those people that can vote and are not voting. This is not a red state. This is a non-voting state. And we have to get those non-voters to come in here and start doing something about <clears throat> the new Texas, about the way that Texas should be. Did you gentlemen want anything before, before I open up? Well, I mean, I, what, I, what I'd say is that uh, vo voting matters, and so I think you're, you're spot on when you're talking about how we have to get people uh, to vote and participate in elections. Uh, yes, I think the, the government is going to be doing uh, what this administration will do with respect to, to immigration, and we've, we've seen uh, some of their policies in effect already. I do think uh, that we have the midterms coming up uh, in, eight, in 18, at, 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 in November of this year, and we'll just have to see whether there, there's a new complexion in the United States Congress after that or not. But the, the final thing I'd say is that what, what has happened is, uh, and, I, and I can't speak uh, for my brother Jose, who's fought voting rights for a long, long time, the, the way districts have been drawn up, not just in Texas but in other states, has really uh, diluted the moderate vote. It is really, it, it, it is, what is it has brought is a, it is not a representation of what our country is, and, and, in, a, and in effect, what, what is manifesting itself in terms of policy in Washington may not all be together consistent with what the, the electorate really wants. And in the end, people have to feel that they have, that they have a, a voice. And if you, if you limit that voice or you shut out that voice, then participation elections are going to continue to go down because it doesn't make any difference. And I think we've got to, we've got to find a way to, to bring some balance to that so people can feel that they can make a difference with their vote. I want to put a face to our dreamers. I mean, we're talking about people that talk about pro-life, uh, pro-life advocates, and these are lives, and lives matter. That's right. These are lives that have faces. These are people whose dreams uh, are in our schools as they're gaining their education. and building for their future, and providing for the support of their families. Uh, we can talk about, each one of us, our own story. We can talk about your story, but we have to understand that these tragic situations have consequences. When you talk about sending somebody who's lived in this country most of their, adult, most of their lives and sending them someplace where they're going to be shot, where they're going to be killed, where they're going to be kidnapped, this happens every day. I can talk to you about people that I work with just last week, and I visited with them, who are living on one acre with five different families because their son, who was living in Mexico, graduated, and then he was kidnapped, and he, was told, he told the family, you need to give up your land to us because they're part of the drug cartel, and if you don't, we're going to kill your son. Well, they took his land, and they killed his son. And they all fled. And they're all living now in the United States. They're not documented. They're recent arrivals. But if you send them back to Mexico, guess what? They're going to be killed. These are real people. These are real tragedies that are facing us. And the consequences are going to be ours to deal with in the long term. Folks, did anybody have anything for any of our panelists? We'd like to... And we're also okay with you not asking questions. <laughs> Hi, um, this, is, this is a question for maybe Ms. Valdez might be able to answer it better. Um, what kind of training are police officers
sectors receiving in terms of SB4 and its implementation. Um, I work a lot on constructing Know Your Rights uh, information and presentation for the community. And um, we've had a bit of trouble with um, some of the more rural, small towns being able to explain what their implementations are. And uh, we just continue to talk to one person after the other and no one, I don't know if this is an issue of communication and they want to say the right thing, or if perhaps, um, I don't know if they're not receiving a particular training and that's even bad for their own officers um, not to know that. So I just want to know what kind of trainings they go in terms of SB4. Again, it depends. There's the rural and the urban um, differences. And, and unfortunately, we're always going to have that. I think the urban departments are very strong in what they present. And basically, it's whatever the law is. Um, and then, above that, uh, usually comes the direction of the leadership. I'm not going to tell my officers, you cannot stop. Um, because, of course, we will get into a law issue. But I will tell my officers, here is our priorities. This is what we need to work on. And, of course, the majority of them are going to go to our priorities. I think the same may happen in a rural situation. If a, a, a police chief or a sheriff um, has a priority of we want federal money in our jails or we want a whole people for the feds because that gives us money, then they're going to lean that way. But uh, again, it goes back to the direction of the leadership. I think if the state was saying that's not one of our priorities, which it is not now, I think um, the culture would eventually change. It takes a while. I took a department that I literally had to change the culture. It took me more than seven years to change that culture and I had to change the whole culture of the department. A lot of that had to do with some of the older ones going away. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of it had to do with training the new ones that were coming in. But the culture does have to change, and, and we have to start somewhere. Thank you. I, I did reach out to the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement to see if they had like a sort of statewide policy, and they said, we just tell them what the law is, and it's pretty much up just to every law. department the 254 counties, I think, to sort of implement it their own way. I think we had somebody back there. Good evening. Uh, my name is Leonard Chan. Uh, my question is, uh, there's been a lot of focus on traditional law enforcement discussion here. What about the more untraditional law enforcement, like certified law enforcement, uh, fire marshals, code enforcement officers? What do you see as the impact on how they're implementing their, pretty much their job? Mm. That's a, I guess that take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that comes back to me. Uh, why am I getting all these questions? <laughs> well, the uh, I, too, again, it's the direction of the leadership. Difference. We do have in, in, in our area, we have a lot of people commissioned by the fire department, by the marshal, and, and, um, and they each lead in their own different manner. Uh, right as I was leaving the sheriff's department, we were being considered to take over um, the, the fire marshal's uh, commission uh, in law enforcement because they do have a commission and they can be commissioned by the fire marshal for law enforcement. So, and, and there's a different direction. There's a different training. And we were complaining that if you're going to be commissioned in law enforcement, you have to be trained in law enforcement, not commissioned by the fire marshal for law enforcement. But again, it goes back to the leadership with the city but the county will direct, and, and, and we have to advocate for the direction that we want. Yeah, and building officials have a tough, time, tough enough time just keeping the electrical code straight. I don't think they'll be involved with respect well, to... Well, you, you were yeah. talking about, about you know, the hospital. It's not, their, it's not the staff's responsibility to check status, yeah. but are, do you, do, have you heard, are people afraid to call the fire department or the paramedics because of SB4? I, I have not. Okay. I have not. I, have not. I, I think if there's an emergency, they're going to call 911 uh, to get to get taken care of. Okay. I think we'll first here, and then, and then we'll go to you, ma'am. Sorry. Yeah, I yeah. think we have to go back to voting. Um, if we, in this state, we really must get voting rights. And to vote, it's really, you know, if you take away people's right. But we also have a state that works very hard to suppress voting. 
voting rights. So that's something that we have to overcome by electing officials that are open to people voting. And I was very surprised. We were at another um, discussion about voting, and someone who was Hispanic said that it is not part of the Hispanic culture to vote. And that really surprised me. Correct. It never occurred to me that it was um, a cultural thing. And so, you're shaking your head no. Well, no, I, I, no, I don't think it's a cultural thing. Is that uh, your question, whether it's whether they can speak to those? Well, the, the, well with, just uh, speaking to voting, right. how right. do you make people understand how important it is when they think their vote doesn't count or whoever they're electing doesn't really represent them? Well, first, to the, yeah. to the question of Latinos not participating, you, you disagree with that? Yeah, I totally disagree with that. I became a citizen five years ago, and when I you know, did the oath to become a citizen, I pledged and I committed myself to vote in every single election. And I know for many people, um, that's the case as well. I think sometimes people don't vote because they, don't, they see the people that are running and they don't offer anything, or they don't have a, a, a platform that uh, makes you want to vote for them. But, uh, and, and also it's hard, like, you know, when I became a citizen, my last name had Montserrat Garibay and my voter registration had Montserrat Garibay Hernandez. And it took me 30 minutes the first time that I voted and they were like, no, you're not this person. I'm like, yes, I just became a citizen. I know my rights and I want to vote. And I stay there 30 minutes. And I think a lot of people have a hard time trying to just the voter suppression, right? And how do you go and how do you vote? Um, and the amount of, of uh, obstacles that, that they put for a person to vote. I think that that's the problem. Um, not necessarily that we don't want to vote. Uh, I disagree with that. I think there's probably a, an importance here in terms of overcoming the perception that it doesn't matter what you do, that you're totally <coughs> helpless in terms of your vote. So we have to be able to provide education so that they understand that there's a way to overcome that. But I think there is an inherent belief that why should I vote it doesn't make a difference. So I think there is some, some, some work to be done there. Absolutely, and yes. let me just tell you, yes. I'm very proud of some of the work that's being done in some of our school districts where they're actually doing voter registration with high their school. high school students now. Okay. And DACA has been instrumental in raising the awareness with our students. They're not eligible to vote yet, but they can't wait to start. And Last question. This is a great topic. It's one I've been wanting to ask a question about since we started, and that is related to voting because not only has fear been perpetrated by the leadership about uh, immigration, but it's also, there's been fear perpetrated about voting. Uh, there has been real um, intimidation of not just immigrant related families, but of anybody that's not, uh, I mean, we have the lowest voting in the country, and there's a reason for that. And the thing that I do want to ask the panel about is that there are some new organizations that have begun to spring up. You'd mentioned one. There's several now, both in the business community and especially in the education community, um, trying to turn around that lowest voting record that we have now. And I wonder how you each have been involved with some of those organizations. There's a new one in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of all the major corporations who are now getting out the message that their employees need to vote and all the education programs that have come to, to into being. Uh, but you've got the Attorney General already out there today saying they can't use school resources to do that. So I, I'd like to know how each of you are involved well, in those kinds of organizations. Well, in, in health care, uh, 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 we would uh, be uh, early voting sites for and encourage people to vote, giving them time to vote, uh, especially you know when uh, uh, you know you've got nurses working for you, they're working 12-hour shifts. We wanted to make sure that it was open, and we would talk about the issues. And here's what's important with respect to for our, our system in terms of healthcare, whether it's the expansion of the Medicaid program, whether it's the uh, the now that's the uh, discussion in Washington, the reauthorization of the CHIP program. Those are things that are important to healthcare, and we would try to make those connections to our workforce. And I think, uh, but one of the things that happens is that, that votes have to matter. And if what you've done is you've effect, if you through the, through the districting system, 
Uh, the way the districts are drawn up, you, if you have virtually disenfranchised someone, then voting doesn't matter as much. Uh, Austin is broken up into five pieces. Uh, and so I think we've got to address that as citizens because what that does is that lowers civic participation on key and major issues for our state and our communities. So within the Texas AFL-CIO, we really do, uh, we work a lot with our uh, different uh, central labor councils to ensure that they are registering to vote. Um, and also we're starting a campaign where we're really uplifting the voices of union members, electricians, uh, pipe fitters, and just letting the, let it, sharing our stories as, as union members on why it's important to vote. So, I mean, with the FLCA, we're doing that, but um, when I was with Education Austin, different organizations got together with, ed, uh, I believe, education, educators vote. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of our teachers within Education Austin that we did blog walking, phone banking, and uh, got teachers to get, got deputized to register people to vote. So there's different efforts going on, but I think that we need to step up to the plate and do more. Folks, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you all very, very much.